on camera. Okay. Um, this is going to be the interview of George Bramlett. George, I'm going to ask you to identify yourself in just a second. Uh, this is December 14th, 2015. We are at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and George has kindly agreed to uh, allow us to interview him. George, would you s just state your uh, complete name, and you don't have to give us your street address, but if you could tell us what city and state you live in. Uh, my name is George Bramlett. Uh, there's a junior attached to that because in my early days I was called junior. Uh, and I live in Tucker, Georgia. That's in DeKalb County, just a few miles from uh, the city limits here of Atlanta. Thank you very much, and I want to thank you for being here today. Um, the, our purpose in being here today is to allow you to tell us about your military service and, and um, just about yourself in general, hopefully for your, your family and friend and for the Atlanta History Center, um, as well as for the Library of Congress. So let me uh, ask you, if you don't mind, just give us a little bit about your background, where you were born and grew up and so forth. Um, <clears throat> I was born in DeKalb County, uh, that's of course here in Georgia, in, uh, on uh, the first day of August in 1929. And I've always lived within a few miles of that birthplace. And back then we were born at home and rather, rather than in the hospital. And you know, you had a midwife come in and the doctor eventually showed up sometime maybe if we get his uh, horse and buggy or his, his uh, uh, <laughs> old model car that would go through the dirt road. But uh, anyway, born there and raised there. Uh, went to public schools uh, in DeKalb County. Rehoboth Elementary School is where I went first through seventh grade. Uh, later on, went to the Clarkston High School. Uh, it was the closest one to us. Uh, even though we were closer in mileage to Tucker, but the district line separated us, and had a had a good experience there. We only had eleven grades uh, in in high school then. No 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 twelfth grade. We got plenty of knowledge in eleven grades, <laughs> and uh, then uh, I had uh, a brother, older brother, and older sister, and. Uh, I was raised in uh, a place uh, 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 owned by my grandparents. Uh, uh, my mother was a single uh, parent after some years, uh, and that was when I was very small. So we were raised by our grandparents, and they had a little acreage there, four or five maybe. And we had a garden, you know, you worked in the garden because that was a rural area then. Uh, it's changed quite a bit in the last 60 or 70, 80 years. But uh, anyway, uh, we did the chores around the house. You know, we had a couple of cows and pigs and uh, garden and that kind of thing. And uh, so we were typical, I guess. We cut stove wood because we had a, a wood stove to cook on and uh, all of those things. And uh, led pretty much a normal life, I suppose, coming up. What year did you graduate high school? I graduated from high school in Clarkston in 1946. Okay. So during World War II, you would have still been in high school at yeah, that time? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Pearl Harbor Day, to start the Second World War, <clears throat> I was 12 years old. I had a broken ankle, and I was sitting up by, it was a kind of a dreary Sunday day, and uh, I was sitting up listening to the radio. Of course, you know, radios were all you had back then if, if you were fortunate enough to have one. But anyway, heard about Pearl Harbor, and uh, that was a memorable day, of course, very memorable day. Sure. My, uh, one of my grandsons, I think my nine-year-old, said to me, is yeah. it true, Poppy, that y'all used to sit on the floor and look at the radio? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's absolutely true. <laughs> yeah, we, we did, yeah, we did. <laughs> Tell me what memories you have from 12 to, let's say, 15 or 16 about what the country was like during World War II, and we'll get to Korea. Yeah, but tell okay. me about that. Uh, my brother, uh, being older, four years older than I am, uh, was uh, drafted, and they put him in the Marine Corps. I believe that was the first time the Marines had uh, drafted people. They depended on volunteers. <clears throat> 
And uh, of course, you know, we were very anxious about his safety and, and that kind of thing because it was a lot of people uh, in the Pacific being killed, you know, quite a, quite a few. And uh, then uh, uh, I was almost draft age when the war ended. I was 16, would have been 17 in a few months. So I was right around the corner being drafted into uh, the service in World War II, but escaped that. And, uh, Do you remember anything about the attitude at school or around the country about World War II and how the country felt uh, about it? Well, we were very patriotic, let me say that. You know, we had, uh, I had an uncle who was an air raid warden, if you remember those, and probably you don't, but you might have read about them. But anyway, uh, fearful of enemy attacks by air force or airplanes of, uh, of a different kind. And, uh, I remember those days, you had blackouts, you know, where you'd, if you had a light on in your house, you'd pull the curtains and hide your light so that if the enemy did fly over, they couldn't see you. Uh, and then uh, it was a day of rationing. Uh, we, we were rationing everything, really, shoes, clothes. You know, you only had a number of shoes, maybe one or two pairs a year, if you could afford them then, that is. <laughs> so. Uh, uh, food was rationed somewhat, uh, and uh, but anyway, we, we survived all that and uh, came out on the good end. So when you graduated in 1946, mm -hmm. was your brother had your brother returned from the Marine no, Corps? No, as a matter of fact, um, he was on Iwo Jima and was wounded there. He saw him raise the first small flag on Mount Sarabachi. He was pinned down with all the other Marines on the beach for a number of days. And uh, anyway, he saw them raise the first flag, and then they sent back to get a large one off one of the ships, brought it back, and he saw them raise the second flag. So, yeah. But he was wounded a few days after that, and uh, we got word of that before I got out of high school. <clears throat> and uh, let's see, 44, I suppose it was, yeah, in the spring of 44, yeah. And I gradu graduated in, no, I guess it was 45, spring of 45, and then I graduated the following uh, June of 46. But uh, naturally, we were very concerned about him even getting back, much less safely. And uh, I guess all people were. And, you know, a lot of the mothers had the gold stars in the windows indicating the lost one. Or maybe, a, a, I believe the gold star was uh, just a, a family member in the service, but then uh, a nowadays silver, silver, I think it's a child that you lost a child. I don't know what it yeah, was. Yeah, then uh, yeah, if you lost someone in yeah. in the army or uh, the service, uh, I believe it was a silver star or something like that. Yeah. But anyway, it was uh, hectic days, and uh, uh, you know you just kind of adjust to the circumstances. Did your brother get back okay? Fine. Uh, yes, he got back. He was he recuperated in Hawaii. And they were preparing, you know, for further uh, invasions toward Japan, mm -hmm. uh, and that would have been quite a quite a thing. But uh, nevertheless, he got back safe, and uh, we were glad to see him back. Okay. So you graduated in '46, yes. and what was the first thing you did after high school? Did you go to uh, work? Or? Well, back then, we we uh, I couldn't afford to go to college, so what I had to do is work at a job. I was in the men's clothing, haberdashery kind of thing. And uh, I went to school at night. I went uh, two, two or three nights per week uh, in, in Atlanta. The uh, University of Georgia had a night school then. They called it the, uh, uh, let me see, the Georgia Evening College, it was called. And it's where Georgia State is now. Of course, Georgia State's all spread out now, but. Uh, uh, then it was contained in what was the old Ivy Street garage behind the Hurt Building there in Atlanta. And uh, of course, when we'd get from one class to another, we'd go up the ramps where the cars used to go to be parked. And that's where the yearbook got its name, the Rampway. But I'm not sure it still is that. It, may it be is amazing. still. Is it still actually, that? Okay. Yes, well, that's where it came from. And I went there a couple of years, and then. Uh, 
uh, pretty soon after that. Let's see, I forgot the. Uh, so that would anyway, have been around 48 or yeah, something. Yeah, it'd been about 48, yeah. Yeah, 48, something like that. What, a couple of years there. And uh, then uh, later on, uh, in 50, came the Korean War. Okay. And, and uh, um, were you, had you enlisted in the military at that point or did you get drafted? Uh, no, I was drafted. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, do your, you do your duty, what you're called to do, do, but it might be under duress or something of the kind. But anyway, uh, I was drafted. And were you single? Then, uh, I was at the time. Or? I was at the time, but me and this lady here, we were we were married in 1951. I was drafted in uh, January of 51, the 12th day, and uh, we had planned to be married anyway. So we were married in June of uh, 1951 while I was in the service. Did y'all grow up together? Did you know each other from uh, school? Or? No, you know we we were we grew up. Uh, fairly close by, four or five miles apart, or two or three maybe, I don't know. But anyway, uh, we didn't know any, each other until, uh, I don't know, a couple of years or so before we married, something like that. Okay. So you got drafted. Did you get drafted in the Army? Uh, yeah, I got <coughs> drafted in the Army and uh, went to Jackson, South Carolina. That's where I took basic training. And uh, uh, quite a quite a chore there. You, you're doing <laughs> things. I, I had never been much of an outdoorsman, and when we went out to the rifle range and lived in pup tents for a week uh, in weather that was about three or four degrees, it was pretty tough on me. <laughs> Not as tough as some that would come later, but uh, quite a change from my, uh, I guess, sheltered life in a okay. way that I'd had. Do you recall at all how long your basic training was at Fort uh, Jackson? Uh, 14 weeks, I believe it was, 14 okay. weeks. And you got there in January 1951? Yes, uh, January. Okay. Uh, uh, took a few days to be processed, you know, and for them to zip your hair off and that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, then you got married in June 51. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Okay, and what was your first duty assignment after... Um, after basic training. After basic training. Uh, uh -huh. I went to a, a infantry leadership training school, and it was uh, a very rigid thing. It was, I'm told, it was about like officer candidate school, even though I didn't go to officer candidate school. Uh, I was drafted for two years, and I, I, I wanted that to be the end of two years. <laughs> be honest with you, okay? <laughs> um, so. Anyway, uh, leadership training school lasted about uh, eight or ten weeks, I suppose it was. Was that like at Jackson also? Yeah, and, and you, of course, come out as a PFC, got my first strike. And, uh, That's a big one. Uh, you, you get a, a few days off, maybe. The, but after that time, instead of being shipped overseas, uh, uh, I was uh, assigned as a cadre for the training facility there. Fort Jackson had a number of trainees. You know, it was really a training facility. Just hundreds and hundreds of um, men went through it. So I was a cadre, and we were, uh, the platoon that I got in was called the aggressor platoon. And we dressed up a little bit different. Our uniforms, instead of being the same color as the GIs, was a little bit different. Our helmet liners had a, 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 what you say, a crown on them or something to make it look a little different. And we, we would be the enemy uh, on some of the training exercises for the, the trainees as they come in. So you'd and, ambush and attack the trainees. Yeah, that kind of thing, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And uh, anyway, I got through with all that, and we were, we were running uh, little uh, weapons um, demonstrations <coughs> for the trainees. And uh, we did all that, and, and it, it was good. And uh, do you recall at the time that you graduated from the Infantry Leadership School, what was the status of the Korean War? Had it started yet? Or? Uh, yes, yes, <coughs> yes. Uh, that's, uh, it started in, what, June of 1950. And uh, I was dra drafted a few months later there. <coughs> 
And uh, it it was pretty pretty rough when I got out of uh, the leadership basic and then the leadership training school. Uh, it was pretty rough. They were they were going up to the Yalu and back down to the Pusan perimeter and all this kind of thing. Uh, it, it was uh, touch and go, and we weren't the victors at all in, in those days. We thought we were, but we weren't. Uh, when some others intervened, you know, and, uh, and just overpowered the American and South Korean forces by just sheer number. So uh, were any of your instructors in either basic or in the infantry leadership school veterans of what was at that time the Korean War? Uh, when no, you all coming back is what no, I'm saying. No, when, when uh, I was in basic training, we had a couple of guys who had uh, been in the Army Reserve forces, and they were cadre for us in basic training. And in later times, we uh, had a guy from Korea that came into our aggressor platoon, uh, and uh, I remember him quite well. Uh, and they had some words to tell you. They they didn't elaborate too much, and most mm -hmm. most GIs don't really. They, they it may be in later years they do, but uh, most of the time, uh, right off the cuff, they don't begin to tell you their experiences. You yeah, know. that's good. You and I both know there's a good reason yeah. for that. Um, so, how long were you in the aggressor platoon? Oh, probably uh, uh, close to a year, uh, just about a year. Okay. And then we had a, a new general come on to the post at uh, Fort Jackson, and he uh, said that anyone who had not served in uh, Korea and who had more than six months left in their term were going. So I got my orders in a few days. Uh, back then it was called FECOM, Far East Command, uh, pipeline, which meant you were going over there and they put you where they wanted you when you got there. So you went over as an individual replacement rather than with a unit? Uh, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, right. A bunch of us went and they decided where we were to go before we got there, you know, went to the way. That's kind of that system kind of followed through later in Vietnam. We went over uh, initially. We went over as units, but yeah, then yeah. later on it was individual. Yeah, I had a good friend that was in uh, drafted a few months before me, and he got into the uh, I believe it was uh, the Oklahoma National Guard. I believe it was, and uh -huh. they went as a unit. Uh, over there and uh, went that way. But we we just filled in. We were just going to be fill-ins for where they needed us. Okay, so you went home and you told your wife, was she back here or was she up there in uh, Fort no, Jackson? No, as a matter of fact, I got a lot of weekend passes just about every weekend and she stayed at home and worked her job. And uh, I would come home on the weekend. We had a guy that had a car and, and we'd buy him some gas and he had transporters back and forth. So uh, uh, that went on, and then we got a 30-day delay en route. And uh, uh, so we enjoyed that when we could. At the so time you got to leave for 30 days. Yeah, right. And we would re report to Seattle, Washington. I forgot the date. It was in June sometime, I suppose, early June, I guess. But anyway... Uh, June of 51. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, June of 51 or June of... Uh, no, that would have been June of 52 uh, then. 52. Yeah, 52. Okay. And what did your wife think when you came home and said, I'm going to Korea? <laughs> well, <laughs> she, she, didn't, she was a little surprised, I suppose, because we was hoping I would stay at Fort Jackson all that time. Yeah. Not that we wanted to shirk our duty, but we just kind of had a sense of personal safety, I guess you'd say. If yeah. hopes had wings, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so did y'all have any children at that time? Or? No, no, we didn't have children until uh, 1955, right? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, tell me about your either your leave home or, or tell me about when you went out to Seattle. Okay, uh, a good friend of mine, that I, and that's one of the things about the Army or any service is the friends you make. Just, just invaluable friends, yes you do. 
uh, not only in the foxhole, so to speak, but just in everyday uh, contact with them and being with them. Just for... Anyway, this young fellow was from South Georgia, and uh, he met us up uh, here, and we caught the plane from here uh, to Seattle. And we had a layover there of, uh, oh, probably a week, maybe four or five days. And that six months period was almost to be up. But when I left the uh, uh, dock in, in Seattle in Puget Sound, uh, I had six months and four days left. <laughs> so uh, anyway, here I went. <clears throat> so we went over on a troop ship called the USS Marine Adder. And uh, that was, uh, everybody got sick, I suppose, partly because you were not going home. You were going away from home. So anyway, got over there finally. And we, we, we came up one bright and early morning, and we looked out. They don't tell you very much uh, on the ship about what's going on, but looked out, and here we, are, here we were in Yokohama Harbor. Yokohama, Japan, and you can imagine what had been going on there <clears throat> 10 years earlier. Uh, and of course, in the background, you can see Mount Fuji there, just all snow covered, beautiful sight, really. It would, have been it would have been good to go under other circumstances, or maybe even today, but uh, it was a beautiful sight. And we trained there for oh, just about a week or so, got our weapons and blah, blah, all this stuff. And so they it, gave you special in-country? Pardon? They gave you special training for what you might expect when you got to Korea? Uh, not, not really. Not, I said training. That might be uh, wrong. Uh, just prepared us to go in, doctrinated us what we could expect in weapons and process, and made sure we had our vaccinations and what have you. Okay. Were, was everybody on the ship a GI? I mean, were they all soldiers and sailors? Mm, except the crew, is that what you mean? Yeah, I mean, was yeah. the, the crew, was it a merchant marine ship or, or a United States Navy ship? Uh, it wasn't a Navy ship, I'm not sure, I'm not sure of that. But I don't think it was a Navy ship. It had been mothballed, though, since World War II. Mm -hmm. And sometime in there, they got it out and restored it. And that sure it makes away. you feel better when you're about to <laughs> sail thousands of miles, get some ship that got out of mothballs, doesn't yeah, it? Right. So you, you wonder uh, if the radar and, and it's got any holes in it. Yeah. Do you remember anything about the indoctrination and the training you got? Uh, well, when we when we got there, it's interesting to know that the barracks we stayed in those four or five days, week week or whatever it was. <clears throat> had been occupied by one of those crack Japanese uh, forces. Uh, uh, someone said they even trained some of the kamikaze pilots there. I'm not sure of that, but I was told that. They didn't have an airstrip right there that I saw, but I'm sure they had one nearby. So anyway, that was what we were told. Uh, okay. you, you begin to see the culture of... Uh, of the uh, Japanese people there as you go in. You, you didn't associate with them. There might be one or two on posts that did various things, but you had very little contact with the, the real Japanese people there. And do so you remember got, the name of the base you were at uh, in Yokohama? It slipped my mind, no, it slipped okay. my mind, but it, it was just a few miles outside of Tokyo. We, uh, we caught a train from the dock where we docked in uh, between Tokyo and Yokohama there, wherever it was, and caught a train and went through Tokyo, and that was quite a sightseeing uh, tour. Mm -hmm. Went up this camp and we got out there, and then after the uh, time there, we caught the same ship back, and we uh, went over to Incheon, which is on the western coast of uh, Korea, and uh, the tides are so high there on the China Sea that they can't always dock, especially big ships. They fluctuate high and low tides. And, and so we had to uh, anchor in the harbor. And then we took the uh, uh, netting or whatever that um, material is called 
the ropes and so on, come down the side of the ship with your duffel bag and your rifle, and you know, <laughs> wonder if you're going to fall in the water and all. <laughs> but anyway, you get you get on the little launch and you go in, and you're in Inchon. And uh, now MacArthur had already gone in Inchon, you know, when they pushed our forces in the South Koreans down to what they called the Pusan perimeter, and uh, almost pushed everybody out to sea, really. But in, uh, MacArthur took the troops in and invaded there and kind of cut off part of the uh, uh, North Korean and Chinese forces. The Chinese were into it by then. So um, anyway, we caught another little train, and we went over to our division uh, rear, which was in Chungcheon. It's yeah. about in the middle of the peninsula. You want to spell that for me? Uh, I believe it's C-H-U-N-C-H-O-N, Chung Chan. It may be C-H-U-N-G, C-H-O-N-G, but it's Chung Chan. And uh, we stayed there. It began to rain while we were there, and it, it comes some big rains and long time rains. It just pours at time. And what time of year was this? This was in June of uh, 52. Okay. And what was the temperature like? Uh, about like it is here in Georgia at that time. Okay. Now the winters are a little bit tougher. They get colder. So it was fairly hot in the 80s uh, or yeah, 90s? Yeah, I'd say in the 80s, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And you said it was raining a lot? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what was the unit you were assigned to when you got um, to I was Chun assigned Chun? to the 8th Infantry Division. Uh, I looked for one of my patches, but I couldn't find it. So I believe it's got an arrow going no, through uh, through the middle no, or something, isn't it? No, isn't that it's, the it's a two sevens. One seven goes this way and down. The other seven comes this way and comes up. So it, okay. it forms an hourglass by two sevens intersecting. I see. And that hourglass was black, and all around was uh, red. I see. Uh, but anyway. Uh, was assigned to Easy Company of the 2nd Battalion of the 17th Buffalo Regiment. And uh, they they had been in the Far East a, a number of years, I think even a co holdover from the Second World War, maybe in Japan, maybe, I'm not sure. And we had forces in uh, Korea as well. But uh, it was a long time uh, unit there, just fighting unit division. The second of the 17th Buffalo, Buffalo Regiment. Uh, 17th Buffalo Regiment, yes. And how, where'd the name Buffalo come from? I, I don't know, but when we, when we first got in, I guess, <coughs> as a possible morale booster of what, they gave us a Buffalo nickel. Hey, 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 okay. hey what you gonna do with a Buffalo nickel? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, we were in that, went up on the front, and uh, <coughs> a bunch of us went together. And then pretty soon, they, uh, uh, well, they, we went directly from that division rear on a troop truck up, and they assigned us to a particular squad in a, in a unit and so on. And uh, so there's what we began to get into the, the real uh, army part of, of Korea. We had bunkers we lived in because we were there. Now, by that time, they were talking peace in Pan Moom John. And uh, I don't know, I've, I've been told all kinds of stories about how hard it was to deal with the uh, Chinese and North Koreans. I think that's still true today <clears throat> from what I hear. But anyway, for instance, they told me that in some of the conference rooms where they were holding peace talks, uh, they were sitting around a table, and they came in, and the Americans sat here, the North Korean Chinese sat here, and the Americans, being a little bit taller, they were above the shorter Orientals, and they called the meeting to an end right then, and changed the heights of the chairs. Okay. <laughs> Presume that's true. It was the story <laughs> uh, that I always heard about the Paris peace talks mm -hmm. ended the Vietnam War was that <clears throat> they insisted on they didn't like the shape of the table. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that they had uh, rectangular tables, and they insisted that it be a long, 
around the table yeah, yeah. so that you couldn't decide nobody, where it began and the ended. Head of the right, table. right. So I think yeah. that's got a common yeah. when you're trying to negotiate uh, in a in a peace treaty situation. So, so when you got up there and you were assigned to a squad, you were a rifleman. Rifleman, yes. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> and did you carry any heavy weapons at all? Or? Uh, right then I didn't. Later on I got to be a BAR man, which is the Browning Automatic Rifle. And and they were uh, real targets. That's what my brother uh, had when he was in uh, uh, on Iwo Jima. Uh, and they kind of picked them out because they put a lot of firepower out. They have magazines that hold, what, 21 rounds, I believe it is. Well, now, they, now yeah. they've got them that hold a couple yeah, of hundred. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Well, the, the Japanese, uh, no, no, I'm getting a different story. The uh, North Koreans, we'll call that the Chinese and all, anyway, the, the enemy, uh, they had a burp gun, and it, it was quite a, uh, a unit of firepower. It would, it, it, the caliber bullets were about 25 caliber, I believe it was, but they, they had a, a huge magazine, and I was told that you'd have about three rounds of uh, ammo in the barrel before the first one got out. See, our M1 rifles depended on the first round getting out and the gas breaching it and putting it in another chamber. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, they, they had they could put out a lot of rounds and, and it had a distinctive sound because you, you hear it one time and you'll never forget it. As Rene called it a burp gun because it went burp, burp, <laughs> like that, several rounds, zip, zip. Okay, so uh, war stories, let's see. When I first got there, they were talking peace, and uh, we didn't have much going on, really, you know, uh, except we we had to pull guard duty. It depended if you had two fellows in your bunker, uh, then you'd be two hours on and two hours off during the night, you know, your guard duty. If you had three, then you'd two on and four off and two on, you know, that kind of, that was good to get some extra guys. Uh, but we, we always were vigilant. You had to be because, you know, you never know. Uh, one time uh, we were kind of stable in a position and the uh, North Koreans came up and uh, uh, we heard a burp gun down the way. It was a little ways from us, not far, but a little way. And they had gone in and uh, shot up two or three of the fellows in one of the bunkers and had taken one prisoner away. So we, we were always vigilant about that. You Somebody had to be fell asleep. Because it's wartime, you know, you, you're yeah. in harm's way, really. Uh, then we, we had other things. We had another incident where our battalion was kind of a, a troubleshooter for the whole uh, division, but battalion being four companies and each company having four squads and they support uh, 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 weapons. Anyway, the, uh, our battalion, if they needed something, some little situation got out of hand, they would call us and we'd go take back a hill or something like this. That was the first real combat I saw. We took a, a little small hill as this unusual formation uh, we had kind of a little ridge of high hills, and that was our MLR, but there was an outpost out here, a little further out, just a, a small little mountain coming up out of nowhere. Just for the civilians, would you explain what an MLR is? Yeah, main uh, line of resistance, yeah. Okay, good. Where, where our defense was set up and there was set up. Uh, it seemed though that they always got the better positions they had in front of us, in uh, where we went on line, by the way, was in the Kumwa Valley. And they had a hill there called number 1062, uh, determined by the height of it. Elevation, yeah. 1062 was there, and they were fortified in that thing, and they were just looking down on us. We were on some good positions, but not <laughs> 1062. But uh, anyway, uh, we, we would have those skirmishes and I suppose the uh, the one that got the most publicity back home was the Battle of Triangle Hill. Uh, that that made the headlines here because my mother had 
I have some clippings at home somewhere uh, uh, that she had clipped out of the newspaper. And she didn't know that was exactly where I was, but she knew I was in the general area there. But anyway, uh, Triangle Hill was quite a, a bloody battle. They, uh, the enemy had come in and taken this hill over Triangle Hill. It, it was composed of one hill, but it had three peaks, more or less, Triangle Hill. So uh, uh, anyway, we were called in to go take it back. They lost it, killed a lot Lucky of our guys. You. So our battalion, <laughs> oh, here we go, heroes, mm -hmm. we're going up. And we got it back, took it back. And uh, 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 we stayed up a day or two there. And uh, then we pulled off and got relieved by another group. I, I don't know who they were, probably another company of our battalion, I suppose. <clears throat> Did you take a lot of casualties taking that hill? Uh, not too many. Now, they, when they overran it initially, the enemy overran it, uh, they had quite a few characters. We had some, yes. Uh, some still left over from uh, the bodies hadn't been all removed uh, from the time that uh, the enemy overran the positions mm -hmm. that we had there. But anyway, we got through that, and uh, then... Uh, we had another little skirmish or two, nothing real serious, nothing like that. That was that was a biggie for me when I was there. And peace still being talked in Pan Moom John. Uh, and, uh, Did you get shot at that day? Uh, I was shot at two or three times. On Triangle Hill, we had a, the group before us had some pretty good bunkers there and, and trench following one bunker to the next and so on. And uh, up on the the, the, the uh, trench was about this high on me, just up to my chin, say. And uh, of course, we all had helmets nat naturally on. And uh, I was going from one, uh, I became a squad leader, by the way. I had a squad of guys and then a squad of nine people, if, you, if somebody's not familiar with that. Yeah, about 36 in a platoon right. and about 200 in a company. Yeah, that's right, right. yeah. So uh, anyway, I was going to see about some of the other fellows in the next uh, bunker there, which was, you know, you you take what you can find, usually some tree limbs or tree branches or whatever you can find, heavy stuff if you can get it, put it over a hole you dig and then put some sandbags on top of that and make a fortification. So if you get hit but around, maybe it won't come through that thing. Uh, nevertheless, I was going over through there, and there was a stone just about as big as a helmet up on the here above my head, up there. and it was closer than I am to you here. Ping! Around hit the rock. I guess the sharpshooter thought it was my helmet, but it, but it wasn't. It was a rock. And of course, you immediately draw your weapon out and look up there, but they're all concealed, you know, and. Uh, they are in the area, but you know, they're not hand to hand kind of thing. So we had all that. And uh, uh, so, as I say, you have to be uh, vigilant at all times, really. Right. And uh, uh, we had things, but uh, after that, we had some skirmishes. And we were uh, back on the main line then, MLR. And uh, let's see, it, it came around to be Halloween, October the 31st. And our fellows. Now again, that'd be 1952 still. Uh, still 52. Right. So they, <laughs> everybody, we had those uh, wire powered telephones. If uh, We didn't have any. And, and the uh, radios were those big backpacks back then. It, all the stuff we had in Korea was left over from the Second World War. And this was one of those big pack units that the radio man carried. You had to get the biggest guy in the unit to carry it because he was the only guy that could carry it. <laughs> That's about right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, anyway, we had uh, uh, those wire power telephones, just like a uh, old-fashioned telephone phone receiver on a dial phone, except you hooked it to commo wire, and there's a, yeah, yeah, and, and it would 
go from one place to the other. So everybody was calling in uh, to the to, to the squad leader and to the command post. Ever something's out here. It's Halloween night, I guess. I think I don't know what the thinking was, but um, we had kind of a restless night. And the next morning, we had a pretty good little river coming down right near us. And I went down to get me some water in my helmet. I didn't dare drink it without putting a halazon tablet in it, you know, but I didn't even do that. Mm -hmm. They provided us pretty good with water that was sterilized or pure. And uh, and I might stop just a minute and tell you that it was unbelievable how good the food was, even when we were pushing around and having some skirmishes. Our company commander always provided us with food. He said, I'm going to provide you with one hot meal a day. And, uh, he was a better he company commander than I was. I wasn't <laughs> able to get him one hot every day. Yeah. I tried. Yeah. We, uh, we, uh, we had, uh, had good, good food. We, we, I'd, I'd say good on the conditions, you know. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, I, I went down to get me some water to, to wash in. I maybe shave. I don't know. Sometime there you didn't worry about <clears throat> shaving for several days. But anyway, I was about, uh, again, about 20 feet or so from the water edge and kaplunk in the water come around, somebody shooting at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I better get out of here. <laughs> so I'm back and got in the bunker, but, you know. You hey, do that water for a while that way. Uh, yeah, I said, yeah. hey, I'm not going back down there. <laughs> I'll, I'll get some water back in. Down I hear the, you. <clears throat> out of the Lister bag. You remember what a Lister bag yes, was? Yes, sir, I sure do. Big old uh, canvas bag with a tap at the end of Yeah, it. right. <laughs> but anyway, we saw some new faces coming up, other soldiers, and they were from one of the airborne divisions, uh, and uh, they had been on Kojido. Koji Do means island, you know, in in uh, Korea. Koji Do. That was where we kept Jap uh, uh, getting wars mixed up. Uh, that's where we kept prisoners, uh, nor uh, North Korean Chinese prisoners. Mm -hmm. And they had been down there, and they were pretty. Uh, what you say, prissy, I guess you'd say. But anyway, they were good soldiers. Uh, but some way, the, the enemy there got a hold of them and, and captured the company commander, uh, a full bird colonel. And uh, they had quite a little row down there, uprising, and we finally got him back. And uh, they decided, well, maybe we need to change the guard down here. So they come got us, the 17th regiment to go down and guard the PWs on Kojala. And uh, so uh, we went back and, and uh, that was into November of 52. And we went back and got uh, a period of training. We had a guy who was from there. He had been one of the uh, forces that uh, guarded and, and did all the work there. He told us uh, some of the things to expect and uh, what had gone on. We, we didn't see so you don't get drift of all that until you're there. And then if we hadn't been going, we wouldn't know anything about it either. But he told us all the circumstances. So uh, uh, he told us that, uh, you know, on the Geneva Convention, you give your name, rank, serial number if you're a, a prisoner of war. Well, they didn't do that. They didn't even give you the name. You just, you just number one, number two, you know. And that way, you didn't get any of their credentials about the rank or any anything like that. So, uh, but they told us also that they had uh, what would be equivalent to one of our generals in the prison of war camp as a prisoner, but nobody knew who it was. Nobody uh, knew which one he was? No, no, see, because you don't get any, they didn't give you any information. You don't know if he's a colonel or a general or who he might be. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> we uh, uh, began to see the first snow, by the way, right right there. We had some squad tents, you know, they hold a, a squad, and you have a little heater that you stick out through the metal hole up there, you know, and you put some kerosene if you can find any and have a little heat. We had that for about a week or so while we kind of 
finish being indoctrinated about what to expect down there. In the prisoner of war camp? In the prisoner of war camp, yeah. Uh -huh. So then we, we all loaded up, went on trucks on further down to Pusan, and went across uh, the southern, excuse me, I believe that's still the South China Sea, I guess it is, I'm, I'm not sure. Anyway, the, the southern coast of Korea there where Pusan is. And uh, we uh, got on uh, small ships. They took uh, just not all at one time, but several at a time, several squads or something like this. And we relieved the uh, rest of the airborne people that were still left down there. And uh, we, uh, it, that was, we didn't learn a lot about what was going on, but we got enough to know, you know, generally what the story was. Uh, they were pretty well organized, the uh, prisoners of war. Uh, I have a little uh, unit here in my uh, possession that I'll show you. They, the Red Cross was on the scene, <coughs> and the Red Cross said that the uh, prisoners of war down there wanted pencils, pencils, all right, right. They wanted soap. And he said there's no way that they could use up that soap because they weren't that clean and they didn't write that many letters. They didn't need a pencil. <laughs> but what they had done is improvised a hand grenade with the graphite out of the pencil lead and the glycerin out of the soap. And they would put a few fragments of whatever they could find. If it wasn't metal, they'd put some stones, anything like that. Improvise a little homemade hand grenade. And to show you how uh, uh, talented they were in, in some areas, they made a bag that couldn't be opened, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, here's a little pen that, that I picked up, and I don't know, I didn't kill anybody to get it, but uh, this was a hold little it. emblem. If you just hold it up so she can oh, focus okay. in on okay. it. Okay. If you see, it has the star, the communist star in the center. And uh, this was the wrappings of something in the sea rations. I don't remember what it was, but some way this had fallen off of a, one of the prisoners that was in there, I guess, and I picked it up some way. We didn't, I didn't kill anybody to get it, but I picked this up and I've had it ever since. So they used the inside of the foil to be the shiny part, you see. Then some way they found the red to go around the star to indicate the communist uh, star. And that's just how ingenious they were, you see. They, they were crafty, crafty people. No question. And uh, uh, anyway, we, what we would do is about once a week, uh, 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 a company of four squads, we would, we would go out and uh, the Red Cross kind of was there supervising the whole thing, you know, and if you got out of line, so they thought, or if the prisoners thought you were out of line, they would uh, cry to the Red Cross and they would see that it was changed. That's the reason they got the pencils and, and the soap, you know, hey, we need more soap, we need more pencils. Uh, so what we would do is just kind of a, a, a raid, a friendly raid, I guess you'd say, uh, to let them know we were looking at them. The shakedown, like they yeah, do in that, the prisons. That's about what it amounted to. Uh -huh. uh, the, the, the barracks they had were long uh, buildings, maybe 50 to 75 feet long, about like one of the North Georgia chicken houses you see. And you had a big door at one end, big door at the other end. And the corridor went right down the middle. And on each side, is they slept at 90 degrees to the center piece. That was their little pad. And uh, what they would do, they would keep somebody on watch all the time, and they couldn't do it really legally. But what they would do, they said, well, we've got to go to the latrine. latrine. The latrine would be right outside up the way a little. Okay, one would go to the latrine, stay a given time, and by the, the, the count all back here, and another guy said, well, he's got to go. So they would cross back. Always somebody watching what we were doing. 
And what we'd do, we'd just go in and bust the door, not bust the door. We'd just go open the door and walk up through there, you know. Of course, we had our rivals, you know, big, big soldiers and all that. So we'd go up through there and let them know we were there. And uh, uh, that, that was about the extent of it. Uh, we didn't have a guard inside the compound with them, but they were fenced in. We had guards around the uh, compound. And... Uh, but anyway, we had uh, we had a, a nice little experience there. I guess you'd say you learn a lot of things as you travel. Uh, Did anybody ever get hurt from any of these homemade grenades? Uh, not while we were there. I think they had kind of stopped all that uh, uh, stuff when we got <coughs> there. But apparently they had hurt somebody. I don't know how severely, but had exploded some, several of them. Uh, I remember we were there Thanksgiving. Uh, uh, before I came home, and uh, we had an alert. We thought that they might be trying to rise up again and bust out of the prison, the, the compounds where they were. So uh, when we ate Thanksgiving uh, uh, dinner that uh, time, we only could eat half staff at the time. Half people would go and eat. The rest of us would be on guard and uh, then we'd uh, uh, switch over, and we'd go eat, and they'd what. But anyway, we, we, to tell you the food, we had turkey and dressing, all the trimmings. Yes, we did. Yeah, we, we had good food. Can't complain about it. <coughs> Even the sea rations were not too bad. Uh, I like corned beef hash, but I think a steady diet of it kind of gets next to you. <laughs> so we had, we had corned beef hash, uh, lima beans and, and ham, weenie beanies, uh, what else? I forgot what all we had. Uh, ham and lima beans. Uh, lima, lima beans. Peanut and, and butter was ham good. Chunks, yeah. And uh, then we had the little packs, uh, 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 accessory packs. I had a couple of cookies, a little uh, uh, instant coffee or instant cocoa, or whatever. Uh, in my squad, uh, incidentally, it was a United Nations effort, and, and my squad was United Nations, you might say. Had me from the south here. <laughs> we had a, a, another guy from uh, a Polish descent. He was uh, from Minnesota or Wisconsin, one or the other. Uh, we had a, a, a guy from Puerto Rico that could barely oh, He understood very little English, very little. And it was a little tough to help him, get him along. Had another guy from Texas. He had he was of Spanish descent, so he could somewhat communicate with that guy in Porter. And we had a, a Afro-American guy from Detroit. Uh, he was a swell guy. All of them were really, because there's a closeness that comes with with that kind of thing, you know. Amen you just, to that. Uh, you know, you, you uh, one for all and all for one. You know, that's that's the way it goes. So uh, uh, anyway, we we had a had a United Nations squad, <laughs> and uh, finally I, I kept. Uh, I knew I was wanting to get out on January the twelfth, which had been two years, which I was drafted for. And I kept telling, we got a new platoon sergeant in there, a platoon uh, a leader who was a lieutenant, second lieutenant. And uh, I kept prodding him, hey, I gotta go home, I'm I'm gonna get out, I gotta go see my wife, and and uh, so on. So anyway, uh, finally I was on guard duty. I was, uh, uh, what you call them, sergeant of the guard, whatever. I had a little guard duty out at a big warehouse there on Koji. And uh, so, they come up in a jeep there, and a couple of guys say, "Hey, Bramley, it's time to go home." I said, "Boy, I'm here <laughs> just a minute. It didn't take me long to get in the jeep." <laughs> so anyway, went back, and uh, so uh, we uh, we had some goodbyes there. We uh, we had a couple of incidentally a couple of uh, South Korean uh, guy guys in there. We, we you know uh, most of the time most of them uh, understood some English, uh, but. Uh, not always. <coughs> South but anyway, Koreans are real good soldiers. Pardon? The South Koreans are yeah, real good yeah, soldiers. They, yeah, they were, yeah. The Rocks. Uh, the Republic Rocks, of yeah. Korea, uh, yeah. Uh, they, had, uh, they called one group of them the Katusa, Korean Army Trained U.S. Army. Katusa, K-O-T-U-S-A. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 
uh, one of them was uh, in our company, and he was an interpreter. Uh, his name slipped my mind right now. But anyway, he he was a good guy, good English, good in Korean, and he he was a good interpreter for us. But uh, anyway, uh, they uh, we had a little party that night. Went down to the PX, and uh, uh, they had some beers. I, I'm I'm a you were still at this island with the POW. Yeah, Koji Do, right? Yeah, Koji Do. Uh, we. Uh, had a little beer party. They drank beer all they could afford, but I, I've never had a taste for it. So you get one, you know, you nurse it around for an hour, you know, and <laughs> set it down. But anyway, uh, had a little party, and we all <laughs> hugged and said goodbye. And so uh, then I went out and uh, caught another little ship off of the pier down there at Koji back to Pusan. And uh, got stayed in Pusan. Now, uh, we were the ones fenced in because uh, civilians and, and others would would just pick up anything. A lot of them were desperate, you know. It just, just didn't have much. And uh, a lot of them would uh, try to break in and steal. So we had a fence around. We had guards all around. What rank were you at this point? Uh, I finally made corporal, okay. and that's what I was discharged as, a corporal. Uh, they said the rank was frozen. The budget did not commit uh, or permit uh, any promotions. But uh, see, I, I should have been a sergeant, first class, maybe or something like that. Particularly, but you never get well. Whatever, you survived. I guess that you come out where you hide on you. So I guess that's a that's good right. thing. That's a that's a promotion of sorts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Got back to Pusan, and we stayed there for a long time. They had some very primitive uh, barracks out there. With, you, you, you know what corrugated metal is. That, they were made out of that, just a, a framework of wood and then the corrugated metal on it. Had two- and three-tier bunks in them and uh, no heating, cooling. But they did have a... Now, South, uh, South Korea there, the bare tip, Pusan, they had some... Cool winters, about like we have here in Atlanta, uh, but not not very much severe weather. That's a little lower south. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, when they all f got assigned to, to their bunks and all, they had several of us left. So there's about three or four of us left, and they had some big barracks there that uh, the South Koreans had used for some kind of academy of some sort, a military academy of some sort. And uh, they said, okay, you guys come on. So we went up and we got a nice inside room. <laughs> Bathroom down here, heated, yeah, oh man, first class. <laughs> but uh, I guess uh, some of the officers who, it was supposed to be for officers, but um, a few of us got in that weren't officers by a long shot. So uh, anyway, we stayed there and we could see from where we were, this part of Pusan was up on a little rise, and we could see the the docks right across the uh, bay. And uh, we'd see big ships come over, and you know, rumors uh, uh, were worse in the army than they are at some garden club or something like that. That's the truth. With no uh, <laughs> offense to the ladies' garden clubs, of course. Uh, but anyway, uh, one day we saw a big ship pull up over there. It's called the General John Pope. I think it had three or four stacks on it, huge. And uh, I believe that's our ship. Of course, we'd had heard rumors. Oh, well, they're going to put us on a plane and fly us home. Hey, yeah, we're going to get home for Christmas. Hey. <laughs> so uh, uh, that didn't work out. We got on a big ship. I think I think they told us there's some something like four thousand troops plus the crew of the ship. It was a big ship, been using again the Second World War, <coughs> and uh, so we left over there on Christmas Day of 1952, and uh, out in the harbor. It looked like the whole fleet of the United, United States Navy was there. 
I think they had a couple of aircraft carriers, destroyers, tenders, tankers, uh, uh, what do you call a uh, big ship that carries fuel. All kinds of things there. And, and they were docked and anchored side by side, like two or, three, two or three aircraft carriers, whatever they had. They were right here. And here we go out, leaving uh, Korea. And uh, anyway, that uh, time we got out to sea, just a little ways out, we didn't get really far away by then, but probably about two or three o'clock, they said they were going to have uh, uh, Christmas dinner for us. Well, they did. They had, again, turkey and dressing, cranberry sauce, and all the trimmings. And uh, Always, that, that well, I thought a, I should have joined the Navy. <laughs> no, no. I got some food when I come on that little ship from Pusan down to Koji. Uh -huh. uh, I got some Navy coffee, <laughs> Navy cornbread, and Navy white beans. <laughs> and the cornbread wasn't very good. I, I like cornbread and beans, but these are those white Navy beans and oh, yeah. beans. And that coffee was, I can drink strong coffee, but th this was just like syrup. I, well, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it, it was strong, let me put it that way. And so I, I had that, but the, the food was good as we came on back. And I guess one thing that made it good, I guess, was the fact we were headed for San Francisco. That makes it the best. And, uh, but anyway, another little uh, feature, they said, okay, come by, we got a little Christmas gift for all you guys. And churches along the West Coast, I think the, uh, I got I got a little couple of items that was uh, sent by someone in, from a church in uh, Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I got was a little uh, uh, billfold, not a, a wallet, but it's a little thing you put just folding money in. It folds over, you know, that and a deck of cards. And it had a little note. A Merry Christmas from Sun Sun Church. Don't lose everything that goes in the wallet. <laughs> yeah, 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 we, yeah right. <laughs> right. But uh, at the time, we didn't have anything to go in the wallet anyway, so we couldn't have a crap game. <laughs> but, uh, but that was one thing I remember in basic that some soldiers would lose the whole month's pay. They'd have a crap game up there starting like on Friday night, and if they didn't have anything Saturday, they'd go away Saturday. Saturday night, Sunday till everybody was broke. Or somebody I have to plead guilty on that one myself. <laughs> yeah. I lost a few and won a few in poker yeah. games. Yeah. Um, so how many days did it take you to get from Pusan back to San Francisco? Uh, something like uh, 10, 10 days, I suppose. A little, a little more than 14 days. Yeah, 14 days. Did you yeah, stop 14. in Hawaii on the way no, back? No, no. Uh, we got <laughs> out in the middle of somewhere out of in the Pacific and uh, the PA came on and uh, the voice said, congratulations men, we're only one mile f from solid ground, from sh uh, solid ground, straight down. <laughs> <laughs> So we were, we, were, uh, we were somewhere in some deep parts of the ocean. But we, we got back, and, and I didn't get sick coming back. I got sick as a buzzard uh, going over. But coming back, I, uh, I was too happy to be coming home. And uh, So did you process out in San Francisco? Is that where you processed Yeah, out? we, we, we uh, docked. Uh, we came under the Golden Gate Bridge. One morning, it was dark, so it must have been four or five o'clock. And I went up on deck, and, and that's the first time I'd ever seen the Golden Gate Bridge. All the lights on it, you know, outlining it, just, just a sight, it was very good. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we uh, eased on up, and we docked down, uh, I forgot the name, uh, they had a pier number, so-and-so. Anyway, we got there, and we got on some buses, motor buses, and some of the guys got on trains, but we had a bunch of us on there, so uh, the rest of us got on buses, and we went up, and we went over the Oakland Bay Bridge and went up the river, I forgot the river, to Pittsburgh. It's a, well, it was a, uh, what you say, a uh, steel mill up there at one time, and I guess that's where it got its name, Pittsburgh. So we went up Pittsburgh, and <clears throat> I forgot the name of that. Uh, might have been Stoneman. It might have been Stone, Camp Stoneman, California, maybe. 
But anyway, wherever it was, we went there and processed. And uh, and uh, just a little uh, sideline, uh, got in there and we got sh showers. We we had showers pretty much on the ship. If, you know, maybe not much, but uh, a little. But anyway, you got uh, that and you got to change your clothes. And uh, they gave us a steak. Uh, to eat as a welcome meal, a steak, baked potato, green salad, milk, or if you want a quart of milk, or two quarts, you can get it, and some kind of dessert. That, that was good. Uh, then that night, I went down to the PX, and I got the biggest banana split I've ever seen <laughs> in my life, and it cost $1. Of course, that was in 1953. See, it'd be turned over into 53 then. But it's about this high, came down like that, and I ate it all. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, then after about, oh, just, oh, I guess three days or so there, two or three days, uh, they put us on a train, and we got put into a Pullman car. I'd been on a train for a brief ride, but never a Pullman car. And I kept that same Pullman car in the same berth all the way down the coast through L.A., Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, New Orleans. Went to New Orleans, but we didn't, you know, get off. What they do, they just change the the engine that pulled it at these different places. That was a Southern Pacific that brought us from San Francisco down to someplace in Texas, we had a dining car, and we'd go up there, had white tablecloths on it. We had a cook that come out, a waiter, take your order. And the food, pretty good, pretty good. Were you in civilian clothes at this point, or were you no, in no, uniform? No, no, still, still, still in uniform. You're still in uniform? Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we got a, uh, let's see, when we processed out, in, and I guess that was right before we left uh, Pusan, uh, you come up with your duffel bag, <clears throat> and you got an individual booth thing here, and a guy here, and you dump it out, spread it up. And anything in there that shouldn't be is, is gone. Uh, but uh, one guy had had smuggled, a friend of mine had smuggled a burp gun in, the one I was telling you about. <laughs> he had smuggled it in to that point, but that's where they ended. That's hey, where they took it. Huh? Yeah, they took it. But uh, yeah, we we still had uh, we had uh, issued uh, GI clothing, you know, saying, but they fit us pretty well with it. And uh, uh, so that's you what came we came back in December. You pardon? had been wearing the wool uniform uh, when you came yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, we had had wool, and yeah, right. And uh, had the khaki shirts, but we did have the wool pants and wool Ike jacket, they called it, you know. Okay, so were you able to take that same train all the way to Atlanta? Uh, all the way. We came through Atlanta, and she was working in Atlanta at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, she was a dental assistant out on 8th Street. And here I was at the terminal station, right where the Richard Russell building is now. That oh, was yeah. the old terminal yeah, station. Yeah, I know where you are. And uh, here I was, and I saw a phone booth, but I... I said, boy, if I get off this train and get left, <laughs> probably court martial me or something. So I, I said, well, I, 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 as much as I want to call her, you know. So uh, anyway, uh, the train finally hooked up there and left, and we went up through uh, Shamley, uh, Norcross, up through that, up that way. And uh, got to Fort Jackson, and... Uh, Still in that same Pullman car, even though we'd changed dining cars and, no. and uh, engines and all. But uh, anyway, we went in there and processed, and it didn't take too long. Meantime, uh, I called my wife, told her I was there. Okay. So uh, she got her brother and two of his buddies to drive her up to from Tucker up to Fort Jackson. Columbia, right, Columbia, right outside of Columbia. In, in Columbia, actually uh -huh. in Columbia. And uh, I told them to meet, meet me at the bus station. That was kind of a central point maybe they could find, really. So they were good enough that they left his, my, her brother's car, my brother-in-law's car, with she and I in the car. <coughs> they caught the bus back.
Oh, that was nice. It, it was very was nice. Very, very nice. nice. Yeah. So after about another day, that was when I first got there, about the first mm -hmm. day or two days. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, anyway, uh, she went out to the guest house and stayed at the guest house on the post for a day or two, night or two. Mm -hmm. And uh, <coughs> so finally, when when I got that discharge paper, and I got it in that right there. I don't know if you all have ever seen Special that before record. or not. But that says official Well, records. the Army got cheap. They yeah. stopped giving us bags to carry it in. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this <laughs> this is what I had all my papers in, my discharge. This this is the part that, that's so good. <laughs> the <that>. honorable discharge. <laughs> back when I got out, of course, back then they had a reserve uh, 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 attachment. Yeah. And uh, I was scheduled to be in the reserves for five years, but I got out in about three. But I was on the inactive role. I didn't go to You didn't have to go camp. to drills or no, anything No like drill, that. no camp, nothing. Uh, but uh, I guess things kind of eased off internationally, whatever. And uh, that's uh, when I got But anyway, I got, got that little thing, and it came off out of the guest house, and I have a picture somewhere of me smiling from ear to ear with this thing in my hand, you know, just ready to go home. And she was ready for me to come home, and so here we are. But uh, uh, it was quite an experience, as I said before, in the Army or in the branch of service, I suppose. You just have experiences that, that, that you wouldn't take a million dollars for or you wouldn't take a million dollars to reenact them. That's true. Uh, and uh, I'm sure my experience wasn't as hazardous as as some in other branches of service or even in Korea because I had some friends that were in that uh, Chozon reservoir business going up and being frozen, frostbite and all this stuff uh, without proper uh, clothing and so on. But uh, it, it's just a good experience to remember and I had kept in touch with some of my friends. Uh, most of them, though, passed away. See, I'm 86, so they, they are, uh, 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 my, most of them gone. Uh, one, one good friend was uh, uh, a boy from uh, Sevierville, Tennessee, a mountaineer, and Gene Rowland. Gene was a prince of a guy, just a good, honest, hard-working guy. And uh, then another guy was uh, Jim Regis from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And Jim was uh, likewise a peach of a guy, really. He, he was good. And so you stayed in touch with those boys that were in your unit uh, after the war? Those two. And uh, another one that was a good friend, uh, my wife and I were, went to his wedding. He was from... Uh, Marshallville, Georgia. Marshallville, Georgia, which is near Fort Valley in Peach County, where they have a lot of people. Uh, and uh, his father uh, was the, uh, what you say, the overseer of a large camellia farm there. Supposed to, they're supposed to have had more varieties of camellias than any place in the world. Hmm. And we went to see that one time, and it was a it was a beautiful garden. You could just walk, walk, and walk, and walk through those things, uh, all the way from reds and pinks and variegated ones and white ones. You know, just all kinds, all varieties, just very good. And then later on, we went back for his wedding, and um, he became a minister. And uh, we lost track of him, but we found out oh, just earlier this year that he had passed away four or five years ago. And his wife is still living down in Valdosta, where he was a, a what you call it, a, a chaplain, I suppose, uh, at uh, uh, Valdosta State College. Uh, but yeah, you you have a lot of good friends, and you. But you know, it's just like family. Sometimes you you have other interests as you your family grows, and some of your good friends you kind of put them aside a little and you begin to do other things with your family and so on. So, so what did you do when you got out of the Army? What? Okay, the first thing I did, we had bought us uh, three acres of ground in Tucker. And uh, 
I had been exposed to building somewhat. My family uh, was into building uh, a lot more than I was. I was never really into it to speak of, but I was around it. So the first thing I did was uh, build a house. Built a house in 1953. And uh, moved in it in the fall of '53. Use your GI Bill? Uh, no, no, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, sometime th there's more strings attached to those uh, things. <laughs> <laughs> so we we had the property, and and we went to a uh, 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 saving and loan association, and they made us a loan, uh, uh, and. Uh, it's yeah, and the, that house, the is, house still is, there, is still there, huh? Still there, yeah. You still living there? Yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. We, we've, we, we've moved about. People that bought it from us are still there. <laughs> yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, we, we uh, have only been uh, uh, in different houses about, let's see, one, two, three other houses in all of our married life. We started out there for four or five years, and then we moved to another house for a matter of months till we built another one. Then we lived there several years and moved to another. But uh, anyway, uh, I went back to the haberdashery business after that for a short while. But uh, the hours were pretty long there. <clears throat> uh, we worked six days a week and Friday nights, you know. So that's before they started opening on Sunday. But anyway, went there. Then later on, I had a friend that was... Uh, uh, working at a wholesale furniture place in Atlanta. And I worked there for four or five years, I suppose it was. In the meantime, I'd gotten kind of the building bug a little bit, I guess you'd say. And I began to build uh, a house, maybe while I worked at another job. But finally got to the point I could work full time building houses. So I started in 1960 building houses full time and just retired in '02, I guess it was. So. Uh, <laughs> Did you build under a? Was there a corporate name you built? Oh uh, well, uh, initially it was not. It was just George Bramlett Builders. But uh, uh, one of my sons is an attorney and said, "Dad, you got to get incorporated now. You limit your liability. You know all this." <laughs> yeah, I'm an attorney. I understand. <laughs> yeah, <are you>? yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so anyway, I incorporated, and uh, uh, as uh, Lunia says, we uh, have a, uh, the other son, we have two sons, and the oldest one is the attorney, the other one is in the building business. And I warned him when he got out of the University of Georgia, I said, Jeff, it's going to be uh, up and down. Sometime you'll have a good run, you'll That's have uh, several years good, and then it's going to hit the bottom. So prepare for it. So anyway, he did. That was good and, uh, advice. He's he's still at it. He, he survived his life's uh, downturn by being able to do some renovations and this kind of thing, uh, additions and whatever. But uh, so y'all have two sons. Two sons. Yeah. Any daughters? Uh, no daughters. No daughters. How many grandchildren you got? We have three yeah, grand, three 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 granddaughters. <laughs> yeah, we have three grandchildren. One, the oldest grandson uh, is a. Uh, uh, oldest grandchild is a son, and he is 34, I believe it is. The next uh, granddaughter, uh, grandchild, is a daughter. She's uh, 31 or two, about that. And then we got another uh, granddaughter, who is 27, say 26, something like that. 26. 26, somewhere along that. Anyway, uh, and I have one great grandson yeah oh, and that's that's the son the oldest son he's uh uh got one uh fine young man oh he's great <laughs> uh, yeah he, he's uh, a year and a half so he's getting to where he can pull all the ornaments off christmas trees now and all that kind of thing <laughs> so now you've got you've got a few awards and decorations you wear the combat instruments badge which yeah. i, I yeah, wear I, I, and i'm very proud of that and yeah Let's see. Uh, do you you have your combat instrument badge with you? Yeah, I have. Mm -hmm. And just for the record, just so that everybody knows, combat instrument badge, you have to serve with an infantry unit in combat at least 30 days continuous in order right. to be entitled mm -hmm. to wear that. 
and that wreath around it is what denotes it as combat instruments. Yeah. Badge. Mm -hmm. And I understand you also have the um, you have the Korean Service Medal with one bronze service star and the United Nations Service Medal as well. Yeah. So yeah. did you bring those with you? Or? I didn't bring the medals, but I brought my uh, paper. Incidentally, before we get too far away, I, while I'm in this little plastic bag, I have a a little New Testament. Uh -huh. And my mother gave me that when I first went in. Actually, it was the day I was drafted. She dated it January the 12th, 1951. Wow. And uh, that survived as well as me. <laughs> but uh, anyway, you read a lot of things about about the New Testament or the Old Testament, the entire Bible. Some people say, well, they had it in their pocket and it shielded them from a bullet. I was going, going to ask you if it stopped any bullets. Yeah. But uh, this didn't get that far. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that protects me, I'm sure. Uh, you know that old saying, there's no atheist in the foxhole? That, that's, that's what I've that's heard. That's the yep. truth, isn't it? Uh, let me see what else I have. No, wait a minute, it's in here. I have here the selective service <coughs> letter that I got. Uh, I was due to be drafted before Christmas in 1951, but the man that was manager of the store where I worked got me a 30 day, a 60 day deferment. And uh, I didn't have to go into January of the next month. He said, Christmas coming up. We're going to have people buying stuff. <laughs> so the draft board was, was good, and they, they let us buy. Uh, Profit motive was alive and well. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah here's my, uh, let's see right here. This is. Uh, Looks like a DD-214. Yeah, yeah, uh, let's see. Is. Let's see. I don't, I don't know, but anyway, that that's uh, what I have. Let's see, Korean Service Medal with one bronze star, and United Service Medal in the CIB. Yeah, the, the, I had three. There's one red uh, ribbon on that. I'm not sure what that was. Could be Good Conduct Medal, maybe. It may have or been. The, yeah. 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 I, I, uh, or the National Defense Service. Medal. <laughs> yeah, it might have been National Defense. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, but it, they didn't credit me with that. Uh -huh. But it doesn't matter. Uh, one one other thing uh, I noticed in the little uh, guideline that you gave me said about being wounded, and and I was never actually wounded, but the word got out to my wife and family that I had been, and it was during that uh, Triangle Hill, which was a pretty severe little battle. And as we were taking it back, of course, we're being bombarded with artillery and mortar rounds and that kind of thing. <clears throat> uh, not too much small arms fire there. But anyway, uh, a round came in. I suppose it was a mortar. It didn't have any sound to speak of. You know, they just come in and blop down on you. Uh, and uh, I was hit on the right shoulder blade in the back. With, with something, and I thought it might have been a piece of shrapnel, and I got one of the guys to look back there, and so he took his bayonet or something and cut my jersey back there, and well, he said, all I see is a big spot about this big uh, bruise, and uh, so I said, well, I'm going down to the aid station. So I went back to the aid station, and they looked at it and said, well, I'll tell you, it, it's just a bad bruise. said, I'd suggest you don't uh, go back to the uh, field hospital. He said there's some bad guys back there, and and you wouldn't even get in the door probably. I said okay, I don't want to go back if I don't need to go. Mm -hmm. So anyway, when I was being discharged, they they recall that uh, it was on record some way. But I said, well, I, I don't think I need a Purple Heart because it really wasn't uh, wounded that much. It was just a bad bruise. But that that shoulder stayed sore for several days after that, a week more after that. You never know. Sometimes, yeah, that's true. That's true. Sometimes it's thirty years later before yeah, it starts yeah. to bother you. Really, I mean, yeah, yeah, know. right, yeah. Uh, so, is there anything that you would like to just sort of 
uh, tell us how you feel about your military service and your uh, service in Korea. Yeah, I've, I've probably already wandered all around that already, but no. uh, I think one of the big things is just the fact you meet some great people and you know that you're in for a particular purpose. And uh, uh, I'm sure that since, well, it seems to me that since World War II, it had, it had the backing of the people. And I'm not sure since that time that we've uh, had the backing of the people in all the wars we've been in. Uh, I'm not sure that we belonged in some of the wars. And I'm not a, not a pacifist, anything like that. I was called to go, and I went, because I felt it was a way of protecting our homeland, and that's, that's what, what it did. Uh, and as I said before, you know, it's, it's, it's an experience you wouldn't want to relive, but you wouldn't want to uh, want to relive it. Wouldn't uh, trade it for anything. That's right. You, you couldn't buy it back. Uh, you, you just wouldn't do it. I think most of us as veterans, combat veterans yeah. particularly, feel that um, it made us who we later became. Now, that might yeah. be good or that yeah, might be right, bad, yeah. but it made us yeah. Yeah. who we became yeah. and we wouldn't swap it yeah. out probably. Yeah, because uh, GIs, we, we, we are great people. Uh, our, our country is, is a great country. It's the best country around, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, with all the other stuff that we, we see some bad stuff here, but it's worse elsewhere. And uh, uh, we, the GIs, that's what they say, the GI is, it can improvise. What we do, you know, uh, we had commo wire, which was uh, <coughs> a plastic kind of wire. We'd use it for communication, but we also had 101 other uses, mainly to make us a, a, a flat bed. You take the commo wire and string it back and forth in this way, make you a, a thing that put your sleeping bag on there and you had your bed. It's better than ground. I've heard it said that duct tape was actually what became duct tape yeah. was originally ammo tape that was used that the army used and somebody said, Boy, this stuff could do a lot of stuff and next yeah. thing you know duct tape yeah. was at every Home Depot at Lowe's yeah. and Lowe's yeah. yeah. so yeah. yeah. I don't know if that's true, but that's what I've always heard. Well, uh that's what what was said in in the Korean War in a way is that <clears throat> we never could have won why well, we didn't win the war. We never could have fought the war if it hadn't been for com commo wire. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was used for everything, you know, people tie up <laughs> things, you know, that's whatever the truth. whatever need. Uh that's the truth. Well, is there anything else you want to tell us before we uh, before we close down? Uh, no, I don't think so. I appreciate you folks uh, listening, giving me an ear for this length of time. I hope I haven't run too long here. No, sir. Uh, no, sir. But uh, anyway. Well, let me, uh, in behalf of the Atlanta History Center and the Legacy Project and the Library of Congress, I'd like to thank you and your wife for being here today uh, and for sharing with us your great memories. Uh, mm -hmm. At that, I think... We are, we are done. Thank you for your service. Thank yeah, you're you quite welcome. Today. And welcome.